Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming to our Center for Personalized Medicine event on informing pregnancy decisions using personalized risk information. The Center for Personalized Medicine is a partnership between the University of Oxford's Center for Human Genetics and St. Anne's College. It's a multidisciplinary communication, engagement, and scholarship vehicle to enable researchers, clinicians, academics, policymakers, and the public to explore the benefits and challenges of personalizing medicine, including questions about what needs to happen to enable effective introduction of scientific and technological advances in both public health approaches and healthcare. So it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today, Professor Anne Gorielli and Dr. Ali Kay. Um, after an undergraduate degree in engineering at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, Anne Gorielli obtained a PhD studying the development of the nervous system of the Drosophila embryo. And she's currently a professor of human genetics based at the MRC Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine at Oxford. Using a human genetics approach, her group's main interests lie in elucidating the mechanisms by which we acquire new germline mutations and the implications of such processes in health and disease. After studying at the Universities of Edinburgh and LSE, Dr. Ali Kay obtained her doctorate at Nuffield College here in Oxford in 2003, um, <clears throat> excuse me, after which she joined Oxford as a postdoctoral researcher working with Professor Gorielli and also Professor Nina Hallowell at Ethox on personalizing reproductive recurrence risks, which we're gonna hear about today. Uh, Al Ali is also a JRF at the Center for Personalized Medicine and St. Anne's College. So thank you very much with that. Further ado, Ali. Okay. Thank you for that introduction, Emily. So thank you for coming. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open our presentation this evening. Uh, just by sort of setting the scene. Uh, and then I'm going to hand you over to Anne here, who's going to explain some of the background science behind a new strategy. And then we're going to take you into a discussion around practitioners' views on that strategy in a more discursive way, presenting some of our qualitative evidence. So why is this important? So when we have new technologies and new techniques um, that, that can, can refine the information that we give to people, this has consequences, um, it's very sort of multifaceted and we need to think about this in lots of different ways. So obviously we need to think about whether it can be done and within that, whether it can be done in a timely and reasonable and cost-effective fashion, whether it can be done in a way that is useful in a clinic setting, whether there is clinical utility, what is its relative value? How does it sit alongside other things and other interventions that are happening? How will it be integrated in clinical practice? So we could think about things like clinical time, what are the facilities within clinic for collecting and storing samples and things like that, but also how does it influence the conversations that happen between practitioners and their clients and whether we need to have parallel developments in those consultations because the type of information is changing and that information may be complicated and more challenging. So today we're going to, um, talk to you about what you might see as a case study within this area of personalised medicine, within personalising recurrence risk information. And specifically this relates to de novo mutations. And if you're not familiar with those, what this means is a genetic change that is considered to be new in the individual, but we're going to unpack that a bit as the presentation goes on. So uh, you may or may not be aware that one in 300 births are affected by de novo mutations. And although that word mutation isn't used in many areas of genetics, it, it still is here if you're wondering why I'm still using that term. We often use genetic change or genetic variant in other contexts. Um, so very serious uh, conditions and disorders in children are often caused by DNMs. And when I say serious, we do need to define that as well. And what we mean is conditions that might involve you know, serious learning difficulties, significant physical impairments, perhaps a combination of them both. And the reason I define it is because uh, Boardman and Clark said in 2022 that often when we produce our papers and we talk about things, we use the term serious conditions and we don't explain what we mean. So that's why I'm, I'm going to the effort of saying that today. So when, um, when a child has a serious condition and testing um, is undertaken, and the family is told 
this child's condition is, is associated with a de novo mutation, it's understandable that the family would want to know whether it can happen again, and the practitioner as well. But the only recurrence risk information uh, that they can be given to take away with and consider when they make their decisions for the future is a population risk recurrence figure, a generic risk figure, which is approximately one to 2%. So um, depending on what's happened to you in your life, you may think that a risk of one to 2% is a small risk. You may think that it's a large risk. It very much is context dependent. So if you've had a child with a very serious genetic condition, that's a life-changing event. And if it's a de novo mutation, it's a very unexpected event. Because it's new, it's new in the family, there's no previous history of that in the family. You weren't expecting that. You've been on that pregnancy journey with all your excitement and your hope. And then you have a child with serious needs that you're currently um, trying to meet. And you've probably been on a diagnostic odyssey to get the information as to the cause of that condition as well. So you may not in fact be reassured by a one to 2% risk. And that's the first thing to consider that there may be this gap between what a practitioner may think is reassuring, but what may be reassuring to a family. It also may not be accurate because it's a population average risk. It may not be accurate for any specific couple. In fact, it, it won't be. And it may be that some people's risk is even lower than that. And that probably is the majority of cases, but they've still got to deal with the only information you can give them in clinic. You may not feeling reassured want to seek reassurance through other types of intervention if you're in this situation. So families may seek reassurance through the interventions that are available to them in the NHS, which is invasive prenatal testing, so CVS, Villa Sampling. Um, and we'll talk about this in more depth as we continue our talk. They may choose not to have more children. And we don't have a lot of information on that because we don't always know because if people don't come back to clinic, we don't we don't know what the, you know what's underneath their decisions what they've decided to do. So I hope I've sort of set the scene there with that background information. I'm going to hand you over to Anne now to explain the new strategy. Thank you very much, Annie. That was really a very nice introduction because I sometimes forget what I do. <laughs> So, so what I'm going to try to do, if you allow me, just to take you back a little bit and just tell you, set up the scene from a research standpoint and just to give you an idea of where we are. And obviously, depending where we, we are, depends what we can do and what we, we can think of introducing in the clinic. So as you probably know, over the last two decades, we've introduced new technology in the clinic and in research, which I call next generation sequencing that completely revolutionized the way that we think about medicine and genetics in general. And one of the approach that has been incredibly helpful is this trio whole genome sequencing. It has really allowed us to access a type of disorders that we did not have easy access before. And this is this disorders associated with de novo mutation, things that occur out of the blue in a family in isolation. And so what this allows us to do is that to sequence the whole genome of mom, dad, and a child, and to try to see within this child, which is the new mutation that has been caused and has arisen apparently de novo, is not present in the parents. In fact, if you do this to all of us, it just turns out that we all have new mutation. In fact, there's about 60 of these de novo mutation in each one of us. And although that may seem to be a lot and that, you know, um, that our genome mutated at each generation, we need to remember that we need to scale this at the level of the whole genome. The whole genome is huge, 3 billion base pairs. So if you put the 60 de novo mutation over the 3 billion base pair, you get a spontaneous mutation rate at each location in your genome of about 1.2, 10 to the minus 8. You don't have to worry about the number. There's a lot of zero. This is extremely rare as an event. Okay? It's actually the fidelity of the material that we pass across generation is incredibly good. However, as Ali has already told you, we know that these de novo mutation cause disease, and actually this happens in a lot of the time, one in 300 live births, that's extremely high. In fact, it's more than the three trisomy altogether for which we test, and we know these are really mostly maternal in origin. They occur as mom gets older. This has allowed us actually to do quite a lot, including to start at rolling out this whole genome sequencing for rare disease as a routine diagnostic within the NHS which means that we're gonna have more and more new diagnostic associated with this and more and more people coming forward just saying, 
What's go is it going to happen again? What is happening to me? So this is where we need to turn to the biology and to the research setting to try to see what do we know? Where do these mutations come from? What may be the risk associated with this? So one of the things that you can do is to do this across a lot of different uh, cohort population, people you know, who don't have necessarily a child with a disorder. Um, and then what we can learn, for example, is that the vast majority of these mutation, three quarters, 75 to 80%, in fact, occur on the paternal chromosome. And this is because they occur during spermatogenesis. So you may remember from your biology course that spermatogenesis is maintained by stem cells that are continually dividing. This is why men maintain their fertility over the whole uh, lifespan, while women's eggs do not divide postnatally. So because this, this stem cell copy the whole genome at each division, they accumulate spontaneous copying errors. And in fact, most of the point mutation are paternal in origin. It's a fact that is not very well known, but actually men uh, carry an extremely important risk associated with this uh, mutation, and it increases with the age of the father. But I'm not going to go into detail about this at the moment. But now if I put this fact together, this extremely rare event of mutation, and the fact that they occur late during spermatogenesis, you can see that this is rare event. It's very unlikely to happen again. In fact, if they were happening at two independent events of mutation, you would ex ex expect it to be 10 to the minus 8 times 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 16, which is less than the whole human population. So it shouldn't happen as two independent events. And as such, the recurrence risk associated with the novel mutation would be expected to be negligible. Right. Had has told you that's not the case. We know practically an empirical recurrence risk are associated with conditions caused by the novel mutation in one to 2%. The first thing to notice is this one to 2%, it's lowish, but it's imprecise. That's why we say one to two, because we're not quite sure where we stand. And in fact, we have known this for a very long time that is associated with this phenomenon that we talk uh, about in genetics, which is very, very well known, but poorly understood that we call conadon mosaicism. So again, let me go back one step back and just remind, remind you of the basic biology of human development. So we all start development the same way with you know, a sperm and an egg that come together, two haploid genomes that combine to form this one uh, fertilized egg, the zygote which then goes through many, many cell division very quickly. If an event of mutation happens during this cell division, which requires that you copy the whole genome, unavoidably, you're gonna have mutation that are segregated within these cells. And in fact, mosaicism is defined by the presence of one or more population of cells with different genotypes, which are represented here by the blue cells. And as development follows, cells follow different cell lineage and end up in different places in the embryo. So one of the, the, the result of this is that mosaicism is actually very difficult to detect. And you can see, for example, in this graph that depending on which sample you take from this individual, you will have cells that contain a mutation, but in other case, they will not be detectable. And in fact, we know that with the current technique that we use in routine analysis, they're not good enough to pick up this low level of mutation. And, to give you an idea, it's just, you know, when you sequence whole genome, you're not going to look at every single position in very much detail. We'd have about 10, 15% chances to just find a mutation associated with this. So mosaicism is really hard to detect if it's present at low level in one of the parents, or if it's present at high level in the child, because making the difference for a mutation that is present at 50-50, one mutant copy and one wild type copy. And if it's just, you had a lot of cells uh, it will be diluted, and so you can't pick up the differences. Then the other problem is that most of the sequencing is done from blood or occasionally saliva, and so that also gives you an average for the whole body, but mutation will be diluted, and actually they're not necessarily relevant to the tissue that you're interested. Imagine that, you know, we're talking about brain development or, or disorders around the, the, this type of phenotype. <clears throat> so mosaicism is difficult to detect, and actually, I would argue that oh, unless you suspect it, you're not even going to look at it. So the type of mosaicism that interests us today is gonadal mosaicism. It's what I mean by gonad is the germ cells, the tissue that contain the germ cells, which are going to make the sperm and the egg. And this is important because, of course, that's what transmits the, mat the, the genetic material across generation. So if mosaicism has a reason in the gonad of one of the parents, rather than having this one-off, very rare event, the mutation can be present in multiple sperm of egg. 
And that now has a really big implication for the risk of transmission across uh, in the next pregnancy. And this is exactly the problem that we're gonna try to tackle today to look at, can we predict and do this better and pick up the cases of neurosis? Because in these, this one to two risk, as Ali said rightly, is a population average. It's things that you know we've collected data over the, the, the years and but we don't actually know exactly how often it happens. And it always happens as the same in the same presentation, a recurrence in the family where you really did not expect it. And that is absolutely traumatic for these parents who've been told, don't worry, it's a one-off event, very low risk, you're good to go. And in fact, they had a chance of at least, which could be as high as 50% if they were, if they had gonadal mosaicism in one of the parents. And in fact, this is made out of two populations, this risk. The vast majority of couples for which the mutation has arisen as a one-off event, because it occurs, for example, late during spermatogenesis, and then a very small proportion of family with an elevated risk who is actually associated with gonadomosaicism in the sperm or the eggs. So I'm going to try to unpick this a little bit more in detail, and please do put up with me with just the basic biology. I've told you that, you know, you start with this the, the, the single cell, and then very quickly, in fact, about 10 cell division, you get to this point in development, which is two weeks of development, 14 days, which is a crucial transition point for our purpose today. This is the point where a very small population of cells, called primoderm germ cells, the progenitor of the germ cells that are going to form sperm and eggs, are just set aside in the embryo and put aside just as a very, very precious cell population. And from then on, the embryo develops very quickly by this process of gastrulation, which completely remodels the different cell lineage and, and, and in fact, from this really generates these three main cell, main cell lineage, which are gonna generate all the body parts uh, during development. It's a very well organized and really dramatic remodeling of the whole embryo. So these 14 days, in fact, is a crucial point because if a mutation originates early during development before these 14 days, it may be present in all the different parts of the body as well as the germ cells, which means that if I interrogate one of the body parts, for example, blood or saliva, I may be able to pick it up. Remember also that the earlier the mutation occur, the more cells it will be <laughs> affecting because of course, you know, if it occurs in an embryo that is already a thousand cells, at the maximum you have one in thousand cells affected later on. So if a mutation occurs very early, pre-14 days, you can have this case where you have both somatic and germline mosaicism, which we refer as mixed. If a mutation occurs post that time, specifically in the primordial lineage, it will be a case of what we call confined gonadal mosaicism. It's only present in the germ cells, but there's not a chance that you will detect it by doing by analyzing a, a somatic tissue. And then of course, there's a case where, I've already said that many times, the more common case, we talk about much later, very late during embryogenesis or during adult spermatogenesis. And this is an extremely rare event at 10 to the minus eight. The key thing here to come to realize is that not only we have a very different recurrence risk, the earlier, the more likely it is to be high, but we also have a difference in tissue distribution. And so depending on the type of mosaicism you're interested, you need to look at different type of tissue. Okay. Now, based on this, we can just really stratify this one to 2% risk into seven categories. So I've just told you, you can have a one-off event, a, a pure confined gonadal mosaicism and mixed mosaicism. And that can happen in dad or it can happen in mom. And these are associated with different recurrence risk. And I've put here question mark at this point. And then you can have a case where the mutation actually was never present in the gonad of the parents, but occurred during the development of the child themselves very early on. And that's what we call postzygotic. So the parents were never involved. The mutation was never present in the parent. And of course, the, the risk of recurrence to the parents is negligible. It's, it's zero, actually, it's not negligible. In this case, it's really zero. So I'm not gonna go into detail because this is complicated, but we can gather information from the literature and I've given you some of the reference if you're interested. The key point here is that because mosaicism is a process that occurs early during development, what happened in mom or dad is exactly the same because it occurs before sex determination. So in fact, you can gather information. And in fact, we know that it's about 8% equally split into mom and dad, equally split into mixed and gonadal mosaicism that are associated 
And that's based on big data that we gather from the literature. And then you can, as I've mentioned to you, 80% of the mutation are pattern in origin, and then you can fill the table to account for this. And that's where these numbers come from. The point here is that if you're able to do sperm analysis, you can actually quantify the risk of gonadal mosaicism for all the paternal cases. For the mother, it's a little bit more complicated because obviously we don't have access to all that. But the result of this is that in fact, if you do the math, it removes indication analysis of sperm or just ruling out the fact that the mutation will ever present in the parent, rules out an indication for prenatal testing in three quarters of the couple. And in fact, we can quantify precisely the risk in about 80%. So for 80% of the people, based on this table, we would be able to give them a personalized risk if we could find a way of stratifying them into one of these seven categories. You will notice here that I have indicated that we can't quantify mixed maternal mosaicism, but quite clearly, if we detect the mutation that has been transmitted to the child in the body tissue of the mother, we know that it's also present in her ovaries, in her oocytes, and therefore the risk is high, although it's not quantifiable. Okay, so this is the basic for the precare study, which is a snackering that stands for precision genetic counseling and reproduction. And I've indicated here the people in Oxford that have participated, Marie and Yumi, were the two postdocs who actually did the heavy lifting for the experimental work. And this is a project that was developed in collaboration with my colleague, Andrew Wilkie. And as you can see, we had a very long list of clinicians across the 17 different NHS trusts in England who recruited patients on our behalf. And we were funded by New Life, the, the BRC, and some money from the Wellcome. And luckily, we had also the support of the Muscatier Memorandum. I've indicated here that we published this study last year, so if you're interested in the details, this is where you can find it. I'm going to take you across the rationale of how we can do this. It is pretty heavy, it is pretty complex, but that's part of the difficulty of introducing potentially a test into the clinic and explaining to people who are going to consent to this test what they're setting themselves up. So we recruited family who were under active care uh, uh, through the clinician and we're considering the reproductive option and we're concerned about recurrent risk, of, about the risk of having another child with the same disorders. As Ali said, this is a complicated uh, uh, situation in which parents feel, and usually they feel very isolated. We recruited a total of 60 families, but I'm going to talk about 58 of them, which correspond to 59 de novo mutation. One of the family had actually two de novo mutation, because we had two families who had had multiple recurrence. And so I'm not going to talk about this because, of course, that completely biased the sample. All of this family had gone through clinical care and there was no suspicion of mosaicism in any of them at this point in time. So the one who had mosaicism at an elevated level had already been ruled out. Okay? So the key aspect of, of pre-care is sample collection. I have mentioned to you that the key thing for mosaicism is to assess the right tissue. You don't know in advance what it is going to be like and where the tissue are going to carry the mutation. So what we did is to try to sample everything we could that was non-invasive. And so we took buccal swab from mom, dad, and the child on the left and the right cheek. We took blood, we took saliva, we took urine from the parent. And most importantly, we got sperm from, the dad, from dad. This is not a tissue that is usually used in genetic analysis, but as you very well know, in the fertility clinic, there is no surprise to be asked for a sperm sample. So the first part of the analysis itself is actually the detection of the mosaic case. So what we did is really to try to interrogate in detail the location where the de novo mutation took place in, in the child in all of the 14 tissue of each family. In each case, we had to develop an assay to look specifically at this location. And essentially what we did is to try to look in detail whether we can pick up any evidence that this particular change is present in one of the parents. Okay, and so we do this using next generation sequencing and Illumina sequencing for people who like the technology, and we do this ultra deep. So to give you an idea, when we do a whole genome, we look at probably 20 to 30 uh, sequence for each of the parents. Here we're going to be looking at something around 50,000 times at that particular location to really scrutinize that region of the genome. Just to give you an idea of how it looked like, this is family one. And in this family, the child had um, acquired a new mutation in this gene, KIF11. It doesn't matter what it is, but the de novo mutation is to specifically check a change at the DNA level from a G to a C. And so what I'm showing you here is that the child, three sample from the child, 
the, the left and the right um, buckle swap, as well as her blood, actually had got one mutant copy and one from uh, uh, one mutant copy and one wild type copy. So one G and one C. That's what it looks at 50 percent. But there is nothing suspicious in the parents. And then we also have three control of people totally unrelated to see where or as it takes us. But because we're looking at very, very uh, uh, high magnification and high sensitivity, sensitivity, I can change the scale and all of a sudden it becomes a little bit clearer. You can see that actually mom carried a mutation in all of the, the, uh, uh, the somatic sample that we analyzed. And in fact, it allows us to determine that she's a mixed mosaic, very low level, that's why it was missed during uh, routine clinical care. And uh, the risk of to discover is actually actually quite high. We don't know what it is, but we know she already had one child with a disorder. It's another family, which again, same presentation, some mutation in MECP2. In this case, it's a deletion, the loss of a G, of a G. And you can see again that the child's got 50% as we would expect, but nothing suspicious in the parents until you look at 70,000 70, sequences we had about 200 that carried the mutation specific in sperm of that. So this would have been missed by most technology, but certainly you needed the right tissue. In this case, because we have the right tissue, we can say the recurrence risk is actually the mutation level that we pick up in the sperm. So it's about one in 400 sperm is mutant. Actually, things are not that bad for that family. It's pretty good. So essentially what I've done so far is to look specifically at the categories that are highlighted here, this category of gonadal mosaicism. I've just shown you the last family. We also picked up three families with mixed mosaicism where we found a mutation both in sperm as well as in the somatic tissue of that. We had another family with a maternal mixed mosaicism and one family where the mutation was definitely not present in the parents, but was found at variable level in the different tissue of the child. So overall, for our 59 different mutations, 10% had occult mosaicism with high recurrence risk, and one had about 2% had just no risk whatsoever. So now that we have accounted for this high level, let's see if we can do a little bit better for the others. And that's, I'm turning now to the other families, that to the other family, the 90%, which were mosaic negative by this technical deep sequencing. The real benefit here is that the vast majority, in fact, 80% of what is left, is actually paternal in origin. And so if we can analyze the sperm and show that the mutation is paternal in origin and not present in sperm, these people are good to go. The mutation was a one-off event, but that requires that we determine the parent of origin of the mutation. And therefore that we know which one of the parents the mutation originated in, and that can potentially be problematic. I wanna point out that the <laughs> tremendous uncertainty for mutation that are maternal in origin because there is this small risk of maternal mosa gonadal mosaicism, which we cannot assess because we do not have access to the eggs of the mother. So this requires the stratification. If we want to reassure people that there is no, we need to show that the mutation is paternal in origin. And so I'm not gonna go into any further detail for the technicality, but this is not a simple task, but it's possible to do. And the way we do it, if you like the technology, is that we use actually common polymorphism, a common variation that allows us to distinguish the maternal and the paternal allele in the child. And I've found near the mutation. And what we do then is just to use long sequencing and this technology that you may have heard of, Oxford Nanopore, that allows us to read the sequence as well as to see whether the mutation is present on the maternal and the paternal allele. So overall, <laughs> this is the data that we got. Don't worry, I'm gonna take you through it slowly. <laughs> So what we've done here is to put the, rec the recurrence risk um, on a logarithmic uh, scale. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is that we started with all family with a risk, of the population risk of one to 2%, which is this red line that you see across. We had mutation in, we had families and we detected mosaicism and I've talked to you about that, about 10%, which is a much higher risk than we anticipate. So they go above the line all of a sudden. Then we had one family in which the child had a negligible risk and so no risk, whatever is left for that child. Then by doing this uh, phasing of the mutation, we found that 60% of the mutation were actually paternal in origin. And here you can see that in this case, the risk goes down by two or three orders of magnitude. And in fact, it's completely limited by the, the quality of the assay. And it's just because you know it's sequencing at this level, we always have little errors that are associated with the technique itself. 
In fact, if we understand the biology of the process, the risk is literally negligible. We had 15%, about nine families, for which we could demonstrate that they were maternal in origin. So this is where there is an ambiguity for this family. We have reduced their risk and we can, and we did a modeling and we can estimate that they have about a risk reduced to 0.5%, but they remain in certainty for these families. And then in fact, we also had some families, nine of them for which we did not find a way to separate the maternal and the paternal enemy, and we could not resolve them. And that also just bring uncertainty and we can model the risk for this family. And in fact, it is lower because of course, some of them, the majority of them will be paternal. And so the risk is about 0.1%, so tenfold less than what they started with. The point here is that for all of the family, we have refined the risk. And in fact, you can see none of them had one, one to 2% risk when they started, which is actually the whole point, this stratification. And yes, we can estimate precisely what the risk is for the, for the paternal mutation, but importantly, we can stratify the risk and bin them into categories of risk being high or negligible. So overall, precare, this is my last slide, is a new paradigm to refine recurrence risk, but then overall, prior to a new pregnancy. You've got time, you can make decisions, and they can be informed decisions. It stratifies this population to discrete risk. As I said, deep sequencing of the key tissue, sperm, allows to identify the majority of couples at high risk, including also mixed maternal mosaicism. And this would allow us to focus the resource on this small group of people, this 10% which are at high risk and we, to whom we should really deploy a lot more of the technology to, asset, to, to help them in the next uh, pregnancy if they decide to go forward. It also allows us to reassure the, the, the majority of couples, but this requires the determination of the parent of origin, which may be problematic. And I think Ali is going to discuss this. Um, so the key point here is that we can do it. We can do better. I've shown you it's quite complex and heavy, and that will require also some consideration. And the question is, you know, would that help people? Uh, and, and with the disclosure of parental origin of the mutation, would be problematic, but also what is an acceptable risk to parents who already have had a child with a disorder. And I'm going to leave this here and let's, which is what you find in the paper, if you're interested, the summary of the data to say that actually the assessment that we had done based on the literature is exactly we recapitulated as part of the study. In fact, we found a little bit more. Um, okay, thank you very much. Ali, you take over. Great, thanks, Anne. So, as Anne just mentioned, if you want to read more on the detail of that study, this is uh, the paper there in Nature Communications. I can put that back up for you after as well. So, um, the next step after this was to um, assemble the EPEG care team to work out what practitioners thought about this in practice. What would this actually mean in a clinic setting? Um, and this is our team, John, this, um, my predecessor, uh, and still keeps in touch with us. Um, so do any of you know Nina Hallowell? Nina Hallowell was actively involved in the project and she's not with us anymore, but it's, you know, it's an honour for us to present um, on her behalf as well. Um, so just to give you a quick overview on this and then I'll dive into what we actually found out. Um, so we had uh, this is a positive study interviewing practitioners who had taken part and referred couples into uh, the original paid care study but it also included some that hadn't, but were very experienced in counselling couples um, who'd had a de novo diagnosis. And we had very good coverage across the NHS trusts. So uh, that, that's really good. And um, it was, we had um, one, one male genetic counsellor, which is not unusual for the distribution uh, of genders in the profession. And uh, four, I will check my details on that afterwards. Um, and, um, the interviews were about 60 minutes in length. So for 20 people, that was quite a lot of data that we had to analyze. So I'm only going to be able to give you a sort of light uh, touch of what we actually found out, but I'm very happy to talk to anyone afterwards about specific aspects. And we use a technique called reflexive thematic analysis. If you're not familiar with that, that's an inductive coding method. So we didn't go in with a set of codes that we were looking for. We uh, approached the data to see uh, what we could find in there with an open mind and um, had no particular agenda. Um, 
Now, this is just uh, to give you an idea of the kind of questions that we had in our semi-structured interview guide. So it was semi-structured to allow some fluidity to see where the conversation would go, but we did need to be fairly organised in the type of information we collected uh, in order for it to be useful should this be implemented in the future. Um, we wanted to know what was happening currently. So when they're providing the population risk at the moment, what's that like? What kind of information and explanations do they give? Um, what was what were the practitioners' own feelings on how well that worked? How did their couples respond? We also wanted to know how that uh, varied if they had gone through the pre-care process. So what kind of information had they given beforehand? How, how had that landed? And, and how did that whole process feel for them? And if, if they were considering it more hypothetically, you know, which scenarios did they feel added most value? Did they feel most comfortable with? This is the thematic map. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into detail on all of this today. I'm going to focus on the more grey down areas, but I'm going to give you um, a flavour of the reassurance gap and tools of reassurance, because that's a very important backdrop drop to understanding um, the responsibility aspect that came out in this. Well, responsibility was constructed in lots of different ways, um, but um, we're going to, you know, it's central to the profession of genetic counselling and to those delivering genetic counselling, because it's not just genetic counsellors that do that, that um, a core function is really to relieve feelings of blame and guilt because they may be, you know, inappropriate and people can misunderstand things. So we're going to delve into how that came out into this as well. So um, one of the things that they said to us was that they were very aware that there was a gap between their own perception of the uh, recurrence risk and what their client's perception was. Although practitioners felt the risk of recurrence was fairly low, they felt fairly comfortable with that, they were aware that recurrence did happen. And in fact, some did tell us that when it did occur, it was actually very traumatic for everyone involved. It's not comfortable to have told someone that the risk is, is what they perceived as low and then for it to happen again, because we're dealing with very serious conditions and families that are already struggling with difficult circumstances. Um, and even if they might feel sort of like they're doing quite well in managing all the different things you need to think about when you have a child with complex needs, um, you know, thinking about the future, uncertainty is difficult. They told us that the current figures felt like fudge figures. And so that's why I've extracted that and put that on there now, because it's quite an interesting way to describe things. They didn't feel like they were really giving people clarity and they felt like they were not being at times straight with people about the risk. But what they also said was it felt it was leaving people in limbo, hence, you know, our parachutists. So you're giving people information, but how useful is that information to them really when they make their decisions? We know from the literature that for families, it often feels more like a binary choice, it either will or it won't happen. Um, when you already feel like something rare has happened to you, you've already been that one in a million, for example. So in that situation, what they said to us was they were happy to offer prenatal testing as a means of reassurance. However, they said that they, they didn't feel this testing was required on medical grounds. It was for reassurance. And we've got to remember that although uh, we now understand that the risks of miscarriage through invasive testing are lower than what we once thought, there are still risks. But also there's a sort of psychosocial situation going on there as well. So you have to be considering, firstly, you have to take the risk of getting pregnant again. And that's not always an easy journey. And then pregnant and you go and have your CBS. But you have to be willing to consider what you will do if the news is in fact not reassuring. So you're actually going on a, on a journey there with that information. And it's not just uh, an, an easy test to go through and you don't always get reassurance. Now, many practitioners said to us they would feel more comfortable if, invas if non-invasive testing was available. However, the current NHS threshold mm -hmm. is that the recurrence risk must be around uh, 10%. But based on the population risk of one to 2%, couples would not be able to access this on the NHS. Now they could go privately, but it's expensive. And so that created um, a, um, a sort of wall there between those who could afford it and those that couldn't. But they expressed some discomfort in this. But what they did say was that they did regard it as having clinical utility and they felt that it would be more comfortable to be able to give people more specific information about their circumstances, but especially when it would revise the risk downwards. 
So that, that was a very sort of good news situation for them. They felt that it was very useful if they could do this before uh, the next pregnancy, because they said they, they don't really know what people are doing when they don't come back to clinic. Um, and when they do come back to clinic, they're often already pregnant, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So to be able to give people helpful information before their next pregnancy would be very, very useful. And it would release them potentially from unnecessary invasive testing, which they had only been offering for reassurance. They were more ambivalent in the cases of when, when we presented the, that, that graphic of the different scenarios of maternal mosaicism, because it left uncertainty. And they thought that it would be difficult to explain and there would still be uncertainty afterwards. While the figure would be refined, it would still um, leave question marks. So, as I already mentioned, um, relieving feelings of guilt and blame was very important to practitioners, and, it, and that's well documented um, for clinical genetics. So this testing procedure, because it involved potentially revealing parent of origin, seemed to prevent uh, present a quandary for our practitioners. They, um, they were very aware that when you go through a difficult pregnancy journey, the couple is a support mechanism to each other and potentially isolating out one parent as carrying the uh, bearing was, was a difficult situation. What, what we've got to do is take a step back in this and remember that when the testing journey first began, the different possible inheritance patterns would have been explained to the family, it would be dominant inheritance, recessive inheritance, etc. And so when they've received the result that it's a de novo mutation, it's sort of um, the best case scenario, almost in a sense. It's out of the blue. It doesn't appear to have come from either of you and the recurrence risk um, is low. And so changing that message felt somewhat uncomfortable and they felt like they would need to have explained a lot of this at the beginning of the journey. It would be difficult to just suddenly change that message. And so... Um, training for practitioners and uh, extra clinic time at the beginning of this journey was the most important thing to make sure that they had prepared everyone. There was some concern about who, who would find it harder to discover that they were the parent of origin, whether it would be the mother or the father. And we got different responses in this area. But um, I suppose one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to remember that there is a gender and a responsibility around pregnancy. And this is well documented in the literature, but um, so I'm not gonna go into it in too much detail because I don't have time, but we know that mothers are very prominent in parental accounts of responsibility. There's been some very interesting research on what happens um, in the clinic and who's receiving the most uh, attention and, and clinic time and involved in most discussions. And, uh, but, you know, even in the research around the shield of safety, there's lots of research about things where we know that there are sort of um, things to consider that can be damaging in a pregnancy, smoking or early drinking and things like that. There's also um, a focus um, on things that it's not proven that these things can be harmful and that can create anxiety for people. So um, we know that this fact of preparation. We also know that age-related concerns are talked about much more for mothers. When people talk about Down syndrome, there's uh, the testing that's available, that's all explained. And in society generally, women are aware of the age-related risks. Whereas what our practitioners told us was, this preparation for fathers doesn't really happen. And particularly in the context of de novo mutations. So changing that message for fathers would be much more challenging. They did also wonder whether um, the, the, the mother blame they perceived to be prevalent in certain uh, ethnic groups might be, um, in some way might make prayer care less appealing for certain groups because, uh, oh, and one of the things they said was, um, for couples who uh, are in consanguineous relationships, they may have been worried that the, the cause of their child's condition was that consanguinity. And so to discover that it was a de novo mutation would actually be a relief. So to go backwards and say, well, actually, no, um, it, 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 you know, it's not a recessive condition, but it did arise from one of them first, might actually be difficult for them. 
and they might prefer to remain in, with the out of the blue messaging. So with that background of psychosocially challenging information, um, it did create for some of our practitioners a sense of was there information that they perhaps didn't want to include in the consultations? Now, in the end, they said it would be paternalistic not to include that information. And so they would want to give all of the information to their families. But what this demonstrated was that this was uncomfortable for them. There was an uncomfortableness in there. Um, added to this, they also said that they thought that mosaicism was complicated to explain and would take considerable clinic time. Um, they worried that the genetic literacy level of many couples would not be sufficient for them to understand this information. And so these two factors of psychosocially challenging information and very complex information um, made them concerned about how they could support autonomy in decision making, because understanding is vitally important to make those autonomous decisions. I'm just running this slightly on time, so I'm just trying to. So where this led us to was a reflection on whether the traditional practice of non-directiveness would be enough in the context of personalised risk information, not only because of the complexity and the psychosocial demands, but also because we've got to add into that the parental responsibility, hence this quotation that I've included here. Um, that even if a practitioner is trying really hard to be non-directive and not tell their clients to, that they may feel an obligation to take any test available and do anything possible. And particularly when that test is being offered by a, a practitioner, they may feel like that is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, what we know from the literature is that in the same way that perceptions of risk are different between clients and practitioners, perceptions of what the role of the practitioner should be is different for the practitioner and the client as well. And clients often want more direction than they're given. And we know from various studies around uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and mitochondrial genetic recurrence risk and other um, issues that um, sometimes clients will ask for more direction. This can create some inconsistency in practitioner practice. And that's what practitioners have reported in other studies. So that was something that we were reflecting on when we were looking at these findings. So a possible alternative is shared decision-making, which can look different in different settings. And we don't really have time to unpack that here, but um, it's just a reflection really, that it's a burden on the patient if the information is too complicated. Uh, you're leaving them with an unreasonable burden in their decision-making process. And so that's worth considering a little further. So, I have had to rush through some of those results, but we've published on some of our thematic findings in a paper in uh, the Journal of Medical Genetics. And we have more coming out, particularly on this notion of responsibility and blame in uh, a paper that's under review at the moment. And I'm happy to provide people with details of those. I'm gonna leave these up for the, for the Q and A, but just as a sort of final overview, what we did find in our study was that practitioners did think that it had clinical value, especially when it would revise the risks downwards or highlight the higher risk couples and then resources could be focused on those couples. It could be used to reassure the majority and uh, it did have implications for who would possibly want or would clarify who would need prenatal testing. But um, from a practical point of view, there were certainly some training needs for practitioners and uh, more clinic time would be needed to go through a careful counselling process beforehand and afterwards. And for that reason, they thought that it would be more appropriately offered in clinical genetics rather than mainstreaming in the first instance. And that possibly a greater directiveness might be needed or at least a lower threshold for understanding. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alina. Such interesting talk.